Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining the webinar of, of CSIS. This is the first series of uh, so many uh, that are coming uh, from CSIS. We are planning to have at least now <clears throat> three uh, webinars on this topic uh, that uh, we want to learn uh, some lessons from other countries that uh, we thought uh, have been successfully tackling the problem of COVID-19 in their respective country. And uh, for the first one, uh, today we have Professor Tiki Pangestu uh, from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. <clears throat> and also from what you can see from the Hello? deep flyer that uh, you all have probably- oh, I think the connection it. is lost. I, I, I still see you, Professor. Okay, okay. Okay, now it's okay. It just says internet connection is unstable. Right. So Professor Tiki also has been with, had been with the WHO in the Geneva uh, as a director of research and uh, policy cooperation. And he will be talking about how Singapore uh, has done it so far. Uh, what do we know and what lies ahead? Because it seems that uh, I read the news today uh, Singapore is still also struggling with the new clusters coming up. And then, the, <clears throat> of course, uh, this is still, I think, a long way to go for us. Now, I'll, I'll let Professor Tiki to take over the microphone for uh, 20 to 25 minutes to present uh, his PowerPoint slides. And then later on, I'll, I'll open the floor uh, before uh, and uh, anybody can uh, just post the question through the Q&A or through chat. And also, you can raise your hand so I can see. And then the, probably I'll, 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 I'll allow you to talk uh, after the presentation. Uh, Professor Tiki Pangestu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philips. And um, it's always a, a pleasure to be part of a CSIS um, event. Uh, as you know, I have a strong sort of family legacy. Uh, as my father was one of the founders of CSIS, so real pleasure to be with you today. So I've been asked to speak about uh, COVID-19, how should we respond, what, what lies ahead? And since I've been based in, in Singapore for the last oh, 10 years or so, uh, maybe focus a bit on the Singapore experience. So I'm going to frame this presentation according to a framework, um, see if I can move the slide. Don't seem to be able to. Hold on. Um, I can't seem to move the slide. Uh, you need to go back to your uh, PowerPoint, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, and then operate it from there. Yes, I am. I, I see my first slide, but I can't move it. Ah, okay. All right. So I'm going to frame, frame this presentation according to a framework that was proposed by this man. Philips, you probably recognize him as Don Rumsfeld. Right. Uh, former U U.S. Secretary of Defense, and he had something that people refer to now as the Rumsfeld dictum or doctrine. And this is what he said. There are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are also known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. And finally, there are also unknowns, unknowns. There are things we do not know, we don't know. So I'm going to try and frame this presentation according to these three elements of the Rumsfeld dictum. So let's begin what, uh, with what is known, knowns at the moment. In Indonesian, just very quickly, apakah ada hal-hal yang kita tahu Kita ketahui. Okay, what do we know? We know. The first one is um, that countries are at different stages of the pandemic and interestingly implementing different strategies to contain them, ranging from the very uh, strict, like what China did, and something to what is very relaxed. I just heard an example from Sweden actually this morning. So that's the first known known. Secondly, as we know, the epicenter is now in Europe and North America. 
which is having 66% of the cases and 80% of the deaths. Although you will note in the last few days that perhaps some stabiliz stabilization is seen in the situation. Third, as uh, Philips indicated, uh, some countries like China, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore have had some success in uh, containment. But other Asian countries like obviously Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, India, may be in either the early or the mid stages of the pandemic and continue to face very big challenges. Fourth, um, these countries that have had some success are currently uh, probably experiencing a second wave that Philip's already alluded to. And this sort of second wave is mostly dealing with local transmission and community spread of the virus rather than imported cases, which was seen during, let's say, the acute first wave of the pandemic. And that's what Singapore is uh, struggling with just in the last 24 hours. Um, in terms of disease severity, we know, I think, I think it's still true, 80% of the cases are mild, 15% but require hospitalization, 5% are severe, requiring ICU intensive care. So I'm, I'm just sort of giving overall averages. And importantly, the severe disease and death mostly occur among older people more than 65 years of age, which includes me, by the way, with, with underlying medical conditions. And I've seen some data to say that the most important underlying condition is actually heart disease, okay? But there are others, obviously hypertension, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, cancer, et cetera. So these are the known knowns. Of course, there are many more, but I'll just stick to these six. What is also very important and perhaps even more important is what we don't know or what we know we don't know, known unknowns. The first of this is what is the true transmissibility and pathogenity of this COVID-19 virus? So the central question here is what is the real R0? Uh, just very quickly, those of you not familiar, R0 is a measure or an index to sort of indicate if you are an infected individual, how many other people will you infect who have not yet been infected? So an R0 of two means that if you're infected, you will infect two other persons, okay? Now, initially up till about, I, I would say maybe three weeks ago, everybody thought COVID-19 had an R0 of about one or two. But unfortunately, because of what happened in Europe in the last three or four weeks, people are beginning to wonder, is the R0 actually much higher? But we don't know that, okay? I have seen some estimates that say maybe the R0 is closer to five or six. But once again, based on what we know now, uh, we really need more data on the, the real R0. The second known unknown is what is the proportion of mild and those asymptomatic cases against those who have severe disease and fatal cases? In other words, what is the true mortality rate? And once again, in the early days, we were thinking mortality rate around 1% for COVID-19. But if you look at the case of Indonesia, the mortality rate is actually much higher than 1%. So once again, we, we don't really know. And of course, the big question here is what is the denominator? Okay, so uh, it's still yet to be seen. And it could well be that maybe different countries have different mortality rate, although that is probably more related to um, the extent of testing, uh, especially accounting for asymptomatic uh, cases. But it's a known, unknown, basically, what is the true mortality rate uh, overall. I've seen so far data that indicates that it could be higher than one or two percent. Maybe on average, it could come ultimately to around four or five percent. I'm just my own personal view. What is the importance and role of these people who are not sick? Okay, what percentage are they of the population? 
also people who are pre-symptomatic, in other words, infected, but not yet having symptoms. And what is not just the percentage, but what is the role of these people in actually spreading the virus, okay? That's another very important unknown. Next, um, questions around, are lockdowns and quarantines actually working? Okay, and you see the case of Wuhan, uh, basically they have relaxed the quarantine. My question is, is it really the time to relax these measures? Are they risking a third wave? That's something we don't know. So unknown, unknown. Uh, importantly, what will happen when the virus or if the virus spreads to regions with weak and fragile healthcare systems? I'm thinking specifically of Africa and Latin America. Some of you may have seen that Brazil has had quite a surge in both cases and uh, fatalities. That's another big question. You know, we sincerely hope that it will not happen, but that's also a big unknown. Um, and more of an academic question, we still don't know actually, where did the virus come from? What is the animal reservoir and how was it linked to humans? Okay, is it the pen pangolin? This is the latest suspect, or is it the bat? Okay, in Indonesian, I believe the pangolin is called a trungiling, and of course the bat is a kalalawar. Okay, so once again, there are many more of these unknowns, but I just thought I, I, I would highlight what in my view at least are the six important ones. The third dictum of Rumsfeld is the unknown unknowns, okay, that what we, we know we don't know right now, okay. So this is sort of very broad ranging. Uh, it revolves around the fact that, that we had no idea this will happen or will be affected. It is entirely unpredictable, uncertain, infinite possibilities. Uh, and to figure this out, you need research, exploration, discovery. You need to share information across borders, sectors, and institutions. And in preparation for something like this, you need the capacity to react, okay? So you need robust systems, not just health systems, okay? Robust systems overall to be in place to deal with the unexpected. In English, this is referred to as a black swan event, something entirely unlikely, unpredictable. In Indonesian, I would say, you would say angsa hitam, kejadian angsa hitam. Okay, so those are the three things that I would like to highlight based on, on Rumsfeld's dictum. And in terms of the unpredictable, Antonio Gutierrez, the UN Secretary General, actually said that the COVID-19 pandemic is the worst crisis humanity has faced since World War II. It's probably true. My reaction to this was that at least in World War II, you can see the enemy. In this case, you can't see the enemy. Okay, so those are the three Rumsfeld's uh, uh, dictum or doctrine, if you like. But those of you who look at this will immediately see there's a fourth one. Now, this did not come from Rumsfeld. This came from some other people who said, actually, there's a fourth category, something called the unknown knowns. We know about it, but we're choosing to either ignore it or to pretend it's not important, okay? And I think you need to be aware of this to sort of get a complete picture. So what are these unknown knowns? And I just highlight three of these. The first is that credible whistleblowers can be ignored or reprimanded for spreading fake news, which turn out to be true. Of course, I'm referring to the case of Dr. Li Wenliang in China, who was uh, reprimanded, uh, uh, actually arrested by the police and um, uh, tragically died of COVID-19. And obviously, you know, his warning turned out to be true. So that's, that's one unknown known that sometimes a lot of people maybe don't want to acknowledge that that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and we have seen this uh, ample evidence, the spread of all these conspiracy theories, politicization of issues, you know, Mr. Trump attacking the WHO, the WHO defending itself, Taiwan being accused of xenophobia, et cetera, et cetera. 
of course, a lot of fake news, stigmatization in the initial stages of anyone that looks Chinese, okay? Xenophobic attack, all of this making the crisis worse. And some of these issues, of course, very sensitive. So maybe people choose not to want to deal with it. And, and finally, uh, and this is something that's becoming very important. Um, quarantines and lockdowns, although they serve a purpose, obviously, exact a huge social and psychological toll on communities and individuals. Uh, I've seen a lot of sort of anecdotal reports on, on increased incidence of stress, depression, domestic violence, child abuse, alcoholism under these kind of conditions. So those are the unknown uh, knowns, okay? So that completes my sort of context or background in the context of those um, um, frameworks. So what now? And in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to uh, highlight the most important message is that what is the most important thing now is you need speed of reaction and anticipation, okay? Speed, anticipation, these are critical to delaying the spread of the virus. And I'm going to use the Singapore experience as an example, uh, perhaps of a country who has reacted speedily and has to whatever extent possible, anticipated uh, possible events from happening. So let me share uh, the Singapore experience according to three areas. The first area is the obvious one, medical and public health response. What has Singapore done? Most importantly, it has focused on contain and monitor. It has focused on rapid, accurate, and extensive testing to confirm the cases. It then isolates and then does very extensive contact tracing. And the idea here is to ring fence the cases within clusters or hotspots and preventing the spread to the wider community. The technical term here is ring fence, uh, those hotspots or clusters. So that's the first thing that I think they've done very well. Secondly, is to restrict movement and implement social distancing. And this includes travel restrictions from outside of Singapore, uh, stay at home and work from home measures, which they have been implementing since the uh, seven since the last two or three weeks. Uh, they have limited or banned large public gatherings, including Friday prayers, for example, in the mosque, and also a large scale people movement. Okay. Uh, this example, of course, during the Chinese New Year, uh, and also the issue of mudik, which is important for Indonesia with the upcom upcoming um, Bulan Puasa and, and Lebaran. So that's the second thing, restrict movement and social distancing. Third, very important to protect the frontline healthcare workers with personal protection equipment. I think it's very tragic that uh, Indonesia, my home country, has lost more than 20 doctors to, to COVID-19. That's, that's a real uh, tragedy. Fourth, uh, Singapore has implemented very good an effective information system, making use of big data analytics, artificial intelligence for really very effective surveillance of tracking the cases in the population. And incidentally, that's what China had also done very well. Uh, particularly, it has helped them in the contact tracing uh, tasks. Finally, um, very important as part of the public health response, transparent and timely risk communication to the public. This includes dealing with fake news and hoaxes, actually have an act to deal with that and individuals can actually be arrested and charged in court for spreading uh, fake news. So that's one dimension of the Singapore response. The second dimension is what I call, or call what is referred to as social capital. And in this case, uh, Singapore has done a lot to strengthen trust in government, 
raise social awareness and social responsibility among the, the population for the sake of the common good. Okay. Um, in this particular instance, I have seen a role for both the government, sort of top-down uh, national policies, however, together with a grassroots approach. Okay, you may know that 80% of the Singapore population lives in public housing. All these public housing have community groups, okay, that work very closely together, even with religious leaders. Okay, so it's both a top-down as well as a bottom-up approach to achieve this goal of raising social awareness by education, awareness raising, and as I said, effective communication. But this has worked also because it is complemented with appropriate regulation and legislation and their enforcement if necessary. So that's the second dimension of the Singapore experience that I think has contributed to their success so far. The third, and before I go on, uh, Vivian Balakrishnan, Minister of Foreign Affairs for Singapore, actually said this in a CNBC interview, social capital of trust and compliance when the chips are down with an extreme situation is absolutely critical, okay? So in other words, the highlight operative word here is compliance. Uh, the Singapore population has been uh, very, in other words, compliant with uh, major government uh, directives. A lot of it must be because they trust the government is acting in their best interest. The third pillar that I want to end with, very important one, is good governance. Okay, And basically, um, the, the, the pillar of the Singapore response is the excellent coordination through an inter-ministerial task force. Not just the Ministry of Health, but all the other line ministries, okay? Including education, including industry, including environment. And this inter-ministerial task force has a very clear line of command and responsibility. And importantly, one can sense very clearly a unity of purpose and goals whenever they do sort of public communication. Um, the second dimension that I see in, in good governance in the Singapore context is courage. Courage together with political will and commitment at the, higher, at the highest levels to take and enforce necessary actions which may not be popular to the general public in the name of the common good. That requires a bit of courage. It requires maybe sacrificing a bit of political capital. You know, those of you who know a bit about international relations or governance generally. So that's the second dimension of uh, how governance was important in the Singapore experience. And as I already mentioned, open channels of information and communication to the public to build trust, transparency, and accountability. I'm still impressed by the fact that every single case in Singapore is sort of the details of those cases where the person has been, the current condition, the age, everything, you can access all that information uh, online. And finally, I think something that I, I need to present because I used to work for the World Health Organization is I think good governance in Singapore has also shown good alignment with the international norms of governance. That is the guidelines that WHO has uh, recommended during uh, this sort of uh, pandemic. So let me just sort of uh, uh, mention right at the end here, I've mentioned the three dimensions of good governance in Singapore. But I'm also aware of the fact that Singapore is probably a special and a unique case, okay? And what works in Singapore may not work in other places. It's a small island, 720 square kilometers, very, a very rich country, very good health infrastructure, very good IT infrastructure, good communications, 
you can't compare that to Indonesia, for example. Okay, I don't know, 13,000 islands spread over 3,000 miles. It's just not transferable, okay, to other situations. But I believe the basic principles probably still hold. So let me end this part of it by highlighting this issue of courage, okay, because I think that's particularly important. Let me cite Tim Ferriss, who said, what we fear doing most is usually what we most need to do. And what we need to do, that requires political courage, okay? And in Indonesia, I can't resist doing this. Apa yang paling kita takuti biasanya adalah tindakan paling penting yang harus kita lakukan. Okay, just uh, to end the Singapore experience, once again, Vivian Balakrishnan uh, said, we need a tripod, I like his uh, metaphor here, a tripod of quality healthcare, good standard of governance, and social capital as foundations for effectively dealing with the pandemic. I think it's a very good analogy and sort of sums up very nicely uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, uh, the sort of the, the linchpin, the three legs of the Singapore approach. Okay, just I think two or three more slides. Uh, Philips asked me to sort of talk a little bit about what lies ahead, okay? And let me just stress these are just uh, final sort of more personal reflections on my part, having followed this, you know, uh, pandemic from uh, the beginning of this year. The first reflection I had is that very importantly, we need strong, resilient, responsive and sustainable health systems to deal with future pandemics. And importantly, because we're all so caught up in COVID-19, we must also ensure that all other aspects of healthcare is maintained during the pandemic crisis, that people with other serious diseases are not neglected, okay? Cancer, heart disease. Singapore, just in the last week, was, was suddenly reminded that they still have a problem with dengue, okay? So that's my first reflection. Let this be a wake up call to countries. You must strengthen your health systems to deal with any eventuality, not just with a pandemic. My second reflection, we need populations which are socially responsible, aware and committed to supporting the government in preserving and strengthening nation building and national identity. It's much bigger than just being doing the right thing to prevent the pandemic spreading. This is about nation building. This is about the strength of Indonesia or Singapore as a sovereign state. That's just my, my second reflection uh, uh, based on, on, on what I've seen in many different countries. Third, probably one of the key messages of this presentation, we need strong political leadership at the highest levels to ensure good governance at all levels, okay? And there are sort of five dimensions to this call. We need to have unity of purpose with no political interference or agendas. I won't mention countries, but there are many countries where this is actually currently happening, where political agendas are actually uh, distracting the priority to deal with the pandemic. Second, to work together in unison, coordination and synergy, therefore avoiding contradictory and confusing policies at different levels, okay, of government. Of course, Singapore doesn't face this, okay, it's a single state, but obviously Indonesia, this applies because you don't have just the federal or the national level, you have the provincial level, you have the, even the sub-provincial, the kabupaten, uh, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So you need sort of um, act together in unison. In Indonesia, I guess you would say, semua harus kompak, yeah? No sort of confusing messages. The third dimension is to be flexible and adaptable, okay? To increase your measures or to pull back when necessary, to have that kind of flexibility. 
Uh, number four, because I'm a researcher, whatever decision you make, it has to be based on evidence, not on ideology, not on political pressure, not on lobby groups, whatever. And finally, of course, you have to walk the talk. You have to provide adequate resources. So those are three reflections. There's just two more that I want to end with. We need to be prepared for the new normal. Okay, everybody talks about the new normal when you sort of thinking what's gonna happen in the future, okay? So what do I mean by the new normal? The way I see it, uh, I see it is that I ultimately, I think we have to learn to live with the virus, okay? And our health systems and our government policies need to have the capacity to fight fires, okay? I say learn to live, but there will be pockets of outbreaks in the future. So we need to be able to fight those fires, okay? Will the virus disappear like what happened with SARS and with MERS? I don't think so, okay, but that's just my personal view. More likely, it will become sort of endemic with mostly mild cases like seasonal flu because as time goes by, people will develop something called herd immunity. So the idea would be that you will see fewer of the severe cases, the fires that will happen, you need to be able to deal with that, but ultimately it will become endemic. I doubt very much it will disappear completely. It may, I may be wrong, but from, from what I've seen so far, I think we just have to learn with it, but uh, keeping in mind that our health systems have to be uh, prepared. And, and finally, uh, once again, because I used to work for the United Nations, I have to get this one in. We need more than ever, okay, all the rhetoric about nationalism, populism, et cetera, et cetera. We need now more than ever regional and international solidarity to avoid unnecessary political polemic, blaming others, okay, conspiracy theories, because the focus should be on the need for collective action based on trust between countries and basically the goal of saving humanity. In Indonesia, I would say we should stop. Jangan marah marah. Yeah? This is not the time to chachi maki, to, to, to get angry at others, to accuse others of all kinds of conspiracy. But solidar, kita harus solidar untuk mencegah dan membatasi penyebaran dari COVID-19 ini. So that last point, uh, my last slide, that last point reminds me of what I saw in the front door of the WHO headquarters building in Geneva, which I think summarizes solidarity very nicely. It says that the mission of the WHO is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health. Thank you for your attention. Sorry to take up 25 minutes. Thank you, Patiki. I think you certainly uh, answer all the questions that uh, we put forward to you uh, for this seminar. Uh, I would not uh, summarize right now, maybe after the Q&A, there are already five questions on the pipeline. If I may start uh, to read the question to you, uh, Professor. Okay. Uh, from the top, I think, <clears throat> no, I think from the, yeah, from the top. Uh, is there any chance to make use of ASEAN mechanism for the future? Cooperation must be broadened and strengthened uh, because uh, it, it is a common threat for all uh, of us in Southeast Asia. That's first question. Uh, I'll, I'll read uh, two questions uh, before I go to the others. Okay. The second question is, uh, this is more on the scientific part of the, the problem. Mm -hmm. Indonesia is increasing, this is from, uh, by the way, from YouTube channel. This is also uh, live streamed uh, through CSIS YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, somebody on the YouTube asked uh, the question, Indonesia is increasing PCR tests up to 10,000 tests a day, but this is still low. Uh, that is about 1.1% per uh, 1,000 population compared to other countries. How much is, you know, if there is any good standard 
how much is the ideal testing rate for a country like uh, Indonesia? So those two questions first, Professor Tiki Pangestu. Okay. Um, first one, um, ASEAN, absolutely. I emphasize not just international, but regional solidarity. And uh, there is so much to be gained from the ASEAN countries sharing their experiences, not just sharing experiences, but providing technical and material uh, assistance to each other. So, uh, so obviously ASEAN uh, does have uh, a health section within the secretariat in Jakarta. Uh, so in, in, uh, in the ideal case scenario, they could or they should be taking an initiative to perhaps convene an ASEAN COVID-19 uh, dialogue platform, okay, to get countries to, to come together. This perhaps should be done with the two WHO regional offices in the ASEAN region, the one in Manila and the one in Delhi. Now, ASEAN has quite a good sort of standing mechanism for senior officers of the ministries of health to meet every year. And I believe also the ministers of health uh, actually meet regularly. I believe it's once every year or once every two years. So the mechanisms are definitely there in place. They have a, a couple of staff members in Jakarta in the secretariat that deal with this issue. So the answer, yes, definitely. I, I hope that ASEAN will take the lead in this regard. Second question, um, ideal testing rate. Now, this is a difficult uh, question to answer, and I'm not going to uh, try to, to tell you that there is an ideal uh, testing rate, except to tell you that, of course, you need to test as many uh, people that you suspect may be infected as possible. Now, obviously, those with uh, that satisfy your criteria of having symptoms of COVID-19, those who actually have symptoms, they obviously should, should be tested. That should be the highest priority. Uh, but um, if, if you have the capacity, the technical capacity, the resources, the access to all these kits, okay, then you should be testing, for example, regularly testing your healthcare workers. And obviously, contact tracing, those people who have come into contact with confirmed cases, you should be testing those as well. But rem remember, because you mentioned PCR, PCR is, is, is not a test where you can just take a test to uh, drop, a, a, you know, a drop of blood or saliva and come up with it in five minutes, okay? It, re it still requires a certain amount of laboratory capacity. So many countries do not have that. It is uh, still not that cheap to do. So at the same time, uh, I know for a fact that a lot of research is going on to develop cheaper and faster tests in order to enable more extensive testing. But a lot of that is still in the development stage and you would want those tests to be accurate, to be reliable, okay, for it to be useful. So I leave that, I leave the answer to that. All right, thank you, uh, Professor Tiki. <clears throat> Before I go on, the, if I may follow up the questions uh, on the, that scientific part, uh, I wanna, if you can the, explain a little bit about the, the, the scientific community in Singapore. How do they work with, with the government or, or, or what do they do uh, you know, during this time of crisis? Is there, like you said, uh, you know, a lot of research going on on the PCR, on, on, on so many aspects of the, of the COVID-19? And how does the scientific community in, in Singapore uh, work uh, with the government? Well, uh, quick answer is they work very closely. Uh, the Ministry of Health uh, is obviously the, the, the lead agency. Uh, there is a National Center for Infectious Diseases, which is also the key institution. And all these sort of institutions um, have very close interlinking between the academic researchers and the policy makers. And that's the other thing that's very, very impressive. Um, they draw very uh, closely on, for example, the School of Public Health at the University of Singapore. They draw very closely on the School of Medicine. Uh, 
um, they also interact with a lot of the more research institutions. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact they have two or three groups working on new diagnostic tests. Uh, they even have a group who's starting to look at the development of vaccines, okay? So it's a research community at all levels, both at the clinical, epidemiological, public health expertise, as well as the basic science. Mm -hmm. And you probably know that in, in the last 20, 30 years, Singapore has invested a lot in biomedical research. And you know, essentially they are reaping the sort of the capacity that they've built uh, to actually utilize that in the time of this uh, COVID crisis. All right, uh, thank you. I'll go now uh, to the other question. To all uh, uh, participants, you can post your question on the Q&A tab on your uh, Zoom at the bottom. And then the, if you post that question, I'll, I'll read it out to uh, Professor Tiki Pangas too. Now, <clears throat> there's another uh, question. Uh, and this is, I think, a very basic, uh, but uh, it is very important. How did the Singapore government respond to the first case? Okay. <laughs> Um, obviously, I think the Singapore government response is very much, uh, let's say, influenced by their experience with SARS back in 2003. You may argue that sort of 17 years ago, but I think SARS left such an impact on the sort of the, uh, the preparedness and the mindset of Singapore, they understood the vulnerability of the country. So how they responded to the first case is basically to take a worst case scenario possibility kind of mindset, okay? So obviously, you know, it's easy to say in hindsight that they did uh, the right thing. There obviously would have been some kind of a little bit of a delay uh, to make sure that there is a trend it's not just one uh, isolated case, but um, I have had discussions with people in the ministry, in the, uh, in the School of Public Health, that uh, certainly within you know, a week or two after the first alert came coming out of China, and especially, I think, once again, going back to your question about scientific capacity, okay, when China released the sequence of the of this of the what is now known as COVID virus, when they released the genetic sequence of that virus within a week to ten days, the Singapore virologists immediately knew that this was a coronavirus, and that if it's a coronavirus, it has the potential to cause serious problems. Mm -hmm. So I would say, and once again, you know, this is my own personal view. The reaction to the first case was, uh, was rapid, was informed by what the Chinese shared. And immediately after that, uh, they were really, uh, let's say all systems were, were alerted to the possibility. All right, thank you, um, Professor Tiki for the, the response. Uh, uh, for those of you who want to uh, ask questions, just post it to the Q&A tab on your uh, Zoom uh, screen. And uh, there is a question that, uh, if I may <clears throat> uh, paraphrase this, because uh, it's uh, very uh, contextual for Indonesia, asking about you know the nature of decentralized decentralization, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. decentralized healthcare systems, and so on. Uh, given your experience with WHO, you you might have researched this uh, since long time ago uh, from all over the world. You know. Uh, what is the peril of having a decentralized, you know, government or decentralized healthcare system in this case? You know, okay. kind of phrase, furthermore, now we have the Singapore model that is highly centralized. We have Beijing model that is highly centralized, but at the same time, you know, if I, we, we could also argue that, well, a democratic country like South Korea also have shown some successful you know, a uh, uh, tackle on, on the COVID-19. And then uh, the Taiwan case also another one, uh, although Taiwan is not in the WHO system given the, you know, the, the, the international politics. So from what you've been seeing uh, in your experience uh, uh, with the WHO, 
how does this uh, uh, you know uh, getting into the equation okay well this is obviously a, a bigger question of decentralization versus uh, centralized control okay and uh, my quick answer to this uh, this question wanted to know the perils okay obviously there are perils and there are advantages um, obviously in the case of uh, many countries with uh, decentralization uh, for me and once again you know i'm not i'm not really a sort of a health system sort of expert but obviously if you decentralize to let's say just say provinces okay one advantage is that you give more autonomy to the provincial governments uh, provincial governments tend to have better knowledge of what their health problems are in terms of what they should be spending their resources on. So having autonomy, having better local knowledge can result in, 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 in more effective use of those uh, resources. Um, the perils I would see uh, as being related to lack of capacity, lack of understanding, lack of, let's say, lack of knowledge about the urgency when something like this happens, okay? And obviously at the central level, you have people who are very knowledgeable, you have epidemiologists, you have public health experts. That may not be the case in Nusa Tenggara Timur or in Papua, okay? So that could uh, lead to delays in actually uh, doing what is necessary. And as I said during my presentation, speed of reaction that is number one. And you mentioned China. Yes, it's centralized, but we will also recall that in the early days of the, of the pandemic, they had a problem with this disconnect between Beijing and Hubei as a province and with Wuhan as a city. They had problems, more sort of a hierarchy coordination problems. So yeah. that's, that's the, the peril of decentralization. So how, how do I... Uh, see this, uh, how do I see uh, a way of solving this? Um, okay, once again, my own personal view, okay? To me, a situation like this is where you don't need democracy, okay? You need a strong hand. You need to say, this is something that affects everybody, you know, the head of state, President Jokowi himself, the prime minister in Singapore has done that. You guys just do what I tell you, okay? Sure, it sounds a bit autocratic, but to me, really, you know, the Singapore example, but once again, it's unique, uh, sort of goes to say uh, that there's probably value in that. And, you know, contrasted with what's happening in the United States, you know, different states are doing different things. That's that's a recipe for, for disaster. But I better stop at that before I get more into political hot All right. water. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, uh, we can we can discuss that in other forum of course. Yeah. Uh, there's this question that uh, you already touched it, uh, a bit earlier. Uh, did Singapore and and South Korea benefit from the previous similar virus like SARS and MERS, which led to the successful method? So if you could explain more about what yeah. are really, what were the experience? And then the second part of the question is, how, what do you think about Vietnam that has a lower case uh, compared to, uh, you know, other countries in Southeast Asia? Okay, um, Singapore and South Korea, as I said, mentioned before, obviously Singapore with their experience with SARS, uh, South Korea because of their experience with the MERS coronavirus. And, and once again, they, they knew very early on, as soon as the Chinese published the genetic sequence that they are dealing here with the coronavirus. So, you know, they were very alert, they were very sort of prepared. And in the case of uh, South Korea, if you remember, uh, their specific experience in terms of what happened in their country with MERS was the, the, the sort of the, it's not the story, the, the, the fact that the infection spread in Korea because of a businessman who came back from the Middle East and then started going 
to a whole bunch of different hospitals because he wasn't satisfied with the treatment or whatever. And in the end, ended up spreading, okay, the virus to, to, to patients uh, in hospital as well as to, 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 to health workers. So that's from the Korea case. So they were very strict to say that, uh, you know, they need to really make sure that that doesn't happen again, that people go around uh, hospital shopping, in other words. Uh, in the context of both Singapore and Korea, uh, Singapore, as you know, lost quite a number of healthcare workers, doctors and nurses, nurses who died of SARS. So they took, once again, very early precautions to protect the healthcare workers, mm. okay? And, you know, that is something that perhaps other countries, because of no direct experience, were not quite prepared, maybe did not have the stockpile of this important, you know, they call it PPE, you know, protective suits and oxygen and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, Singapore and South Korea, okay, uh, have learned basically from that. Uh, Vietnam, I, I'm not that familiar with the situation, but uh, from what I have seen, they have, uh, once again, I would say Vietnam is fairly centralized in terms of its command structure. At the end of the day, I believe, I don't know, Philips, you probably know better than me, it's still a, a communist sort of centralized uh, political system. So I believe that they have um, uh, pandemic committees at all the provincial levels that mm. adhere very strictly. And I believe uh, social distancing has been implemented. Um, um, and I believe also population density may have a little bit to do with it. Vietnam, as you know, has got this very this sort of like a long uh, uh, sort of uh, physical geography spread out. Uh, so uh, other than Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh, they probably don't have large uh, urban settings. That's been a problem with like in, in New York, for example. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know enough, but I believe that partly because of centralized control, partly because of social distancing and partly because of maybe lower population density. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of the unknown unknowns, probably. Yes, of course, of course. As I said, we can we can uh, maybe you and I can 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 expand that list and 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 write a commentary for your for your website. Okay, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are waiting for that. <laughs> now uh, there's a question from YouTube, uh, you know, uh, channel. Uh, uh, last night, this is uh, about Singapore. Last night, Singapore experienced double increase of COVID cases, new COVID cases. What does it mean? Uh, does it mean the government the government measure? is ineffective or it's just you know something that is beyond the beyond the beyond the government uh, that 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 uh, new cases can just emerge anywhere okay um yeah um of course last night was a big shock uh, more than double the number of cases uh, single largest number of cases in a day um i i would say that uh, you have to look at this in in, in context of the 287 new cases, about 219 were linked to um, already existing clusters, which are in the dormitories of foreign workers. As you know, Singapore has a large number of uh, foreign workers, I think almost a million. And they are housed in these dormitories. Each one of these dormitories contain large numbers, you know, at least five, six, even more than 7,000 uh, workers in these dormitories. Five of those dormitories have now been designated as isolation zones. Uh, in other words, they've been put on lockdown and, and, and quarantine. So 219 out of the 287 cases came from this cluster. So you need to keep that in perspective. These are not cases that have randomly appeared amongst the general population of Singapore, okay? Now, I don't think it's a question of being uh, ineffective. I would say that, I don't know, perhaps they could have anticipated this a little bit earlier, knowing the conditions, the crowded conditions that these foreign workers um, um, uh, live in. Uh, but I think uh, they have, definitely now taken the, the steps 
the right steps to 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 sort of uh, uh, deal with these uh, five dormitories. Uh, people are being moved out. They're being spread out to other facilities. And the other thing that I think was good news is that these uh, confirmed cases, these 219, they are well. They are not sick, you know. Uh, and for me, that's a big relief. You know, it would be tragic if they end up with severe sort of symptoms, they end up in ICU, you know, they are so far away from home. That would be a tragedy, but they're well. So, and importantly, the Singapore economy is so reliant on foreign workers. And many of these are working in what the government calls essential services. So those who are working in essential services who are well have been moved to separate areas. So they have um, um, requisition, uh, Singapore Expo site. They have requisition army camps. They have requisition um, um, unoccupied housing board uh, flats. So I think um, the reaction has been swift, has been uh, uh, exactly what is currently needed. I may be wrong, you know, it, it may take time, but uh, I think the next 10 days hopefully we'll see uh, a reduction in this sort of uh, new cases linked to these clusters, at least. There are very few uh, um, imported cases now. And I think of the 287, uh, maybe about 40 were locally transmitted and unlinked to these uh, foreign worker cases. So you need to keep that in, in, in perspective. All right. Thank you. Um, now, next question about uh, the use of AI, big data, okay. you mentioned mm -hmm. somewhere in your presentation. Uh, yes. Would you uh, explore that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is that um, I was referring um, mostly to the um, experience of China. Okay. And uh, certainly in Wuhan, they employed big data analytics to its uh, maximum. Uh, coupled with you know, all the algorithms, the, the mathematical modeling, the AI machine learning capabilities they had, coupled with uh, technologies like drone surveillance, uh, facial recognition, uh, linking it to the uh, health data of individuals. Okay, To the extent that they were able, for example, if somebody was um, confirmed by testing to have COVID to then actually track that person's movements over the last 24, 48 hours. Which shop he went to, who, which shopkeeper did he hand the money to? Uh, which way did he go home? Who were his family members? What were the neighbors around the neighborhood? So they were very uh, um, effective in applying these technologies in terms of uh, what a lot of people have referred to as mass surveillance technologies. Now, I'm fairly sure that Singapore did not go to that sort of uh, extent, but they certainly obviously have a very good health database of, of most of their uh, population, uh, national health uh, database. Um, obviously, they have uh, a good system of national uh, registration. Uh, so, um, and obviously, uh, they have um, uh, within the National Environment Agency, as well as the Ministry of Health, um, resources and manpower to actually do uh, what amounts to actually manual contract, uh, contact tracing, you know, two or 3,000 people actually going to households and then enriching the database, and that database is growing. Uh, all the time. So I think in, in, in future, certainly, uh, I think this technology uh, could help uh, a lot of countries uh, in terms of, uh, uh, especially in terms of surveillance. But of course, as you well know, with this kind of technology, there is a lot of issues around confidentiality, around whether this is sort of, you know, Big Brother 1984, uh, all the human rights and ethics issues. But once again, you know, with the right safeguards, if the ultimate um, benefit 
is to be able to do effective contact tracing. I think once again, you know, maybe China can do it, maybe Singapore can do it. I'm not sure whether other countries will have the political will and the systems to pull that off. Sorry, uh, yes, I can't hear. Okay. A follow up question on that. Uh, uh, somebody by the name of uh, Sinji ask a question about this. Uh, in Singapore, some communities seem to encourage people to report to authority about those who violate recent government measures. So this is the other side of the big brother is watching you. You know, that is now the community. It, it might increase distrust actually among, you know, among people. So how do you see this? Okay, Shin, Shinji is actually one of my students. All right, okay. In Singapore. So Shinji, yeah, uh, that's a very good point. And, and I'll give you a few extra marks when I grade your papers uh, <laughs> into this one. You should thank uh, me, Shinji. Uh, uh, a very good question, obviously. And, you know, it, it brings uh, to mind, you know, this whole question of um, whether they are sort of community-based spies who are informing on citizens and reporting it to the government, which I think was a problem in, in China, in, 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 even in more recent times, okay? Uh, a big problem in, in East Germany during Stasi, for example, if you, if you, if you recall. Now, in Singapore, <laughs> uh, uh, my son is actually working in, in Singapore, and anecdotally, he told me of uh, some uh, taxi and Grab and Gojek drivers actually reporting them for going to places within Singapore, which is not their home, okay? Going to places because there is a stay-at-home advisory, okay? So whether this is happening because of uh, enthusiasm, you know, in the, in, the, in the best case scenario, these people are being good citizens, they're being enthusiastic, helping the government, or are they just being busybodies? Uh, that that is a moral judgment <laughs> that I'm not going to go into, but it's a good point, and it, it could very well lead to sort of uh, uh, some level of uh, mistrust. All right, okay. Uh, There's another question from Singapore, <clears throat> uh, from Melissa, about international solidarity. You did mention about this in your reflection. <clears throat> what do you think is needed to help countries trust each other and work together? To respond to COVID-19 and probably for future pandemics uh, in the time where the two superpowers are kind of uh, hitting each other, the US, China, and so on. What are yeah. the realities now? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's once again a, a much bigger question uh, related to the, you know, is there still value in multilateralism, okay? Uh, I think, Philips, you have more of a uh, IR, political science, economics background than, than I have. So once again, this is a much bigger question. Um, uh, you also then talk about uh, is with what has happened, it has China basically taken over from the United States as sort of the global uh, trendsetter, even in uh, this particular area of yeah. pandemic response? given that they're way ahead of the curve in terms of implementing measures, they're way ahead of the curve in terms of helping other countries, okay? So my answer to, to, to the question is that, as I said before, you know, I used to work for the UN, so my answer is probably not so objective. I believe multilateral institutions and the United Nations in particular is needed now more than ever, okay? Regardless of the China, US, Japan, whatever, big power, rich country dynamics, don't forget the smaller, the poorer countries. If you focus on the big powers, these countries are gonna get left behind. So the value of multilateralism, the value of WHO is that it's the only institution that will champion the health of poor people, okay? So the value would be to get 
the big powers to sort of continue to support multilateralism as an ideal, as a, as a principle. So it's very worrying to hear this. I'm trying to not use a bad word here. To, to hear a certain president of the most powerful country in the world threatening to cut funding to the WHO. I mean, that's so petty. You know, that's so small minded when you should be saying, I'm going to give 10 times more money to the WHO. But once again, on the political level, that goes back to his worldview mm -hmm. of America first, populism, nationalism, denying science. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what multilateralism is all about. Improving trust between countries, championing the poor, and always, always driven what is the evidence. You know, I was so upset when I see Trump trying to sort of um, actually challenge Tony Fauci, who is one of the most respected, you know, infectious disease specialists in the world. And, you know, he's talking completely evidence free. I mean, it's just what he thinks. And he always thinks he's right, obviously. So I better stop there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, if I may be the devil advocate here, <clears throat> uh, Professor Wang Estu, uh, how do you see WHO? Is there anything that we can do or is there anything needed for WHO to, to establish a more robust uh, monitoring and evaluation of the, for example, for the IHR, the International Health Regulations? Because, you know, country reports are good, uh, including Indonesian report to I, IHR. I think uh, WHO always uh, gave a, a good mark, but uh, now we know that it's not enough. So how do you see this? Uh, you know, how can WHO is also be reformed? Yeah, I think um, that's a question I've been asked quite a lot. And I guess that there are a few sort of uh, factors that could happen that maybe would increase the effectiveness of the organization in future. Uh, what the first um, sort of, um, let's say weakness of WHO is clearly lack of resources, okay? There has been zero growth uh, in the budget of the WHO for the last 10 or 15 years, okay? To put it in perspective, the annual budget of WHO is $2.2 billion, okay? That's the budget of a medium-sized hospital in the United States, okay? WHO is an organization with 7,000 employees, 160 country offices, and six regional offices. And the budget is the same size as the medium-sized hospital in the US. So that limits its uh, ability to do certain things. Secondly, countries are asking WHO to do more and more, and yet not giving resources. Okay, and because WHO basically is a political organization, it has to respond to the country demands. So more and more things are being asked beyond pandemics, obviously. Okay, uh, chronic diseases, for example, just one example. Stunting, another example, important for Indonesia, nutrition. Okay, and yet the budget is not there. The third weakness of WHO is the organizational structure because there is one headquarter in Geneva. There is six regional offices in different parts of the world. There's 160 country offices. Sometimes there is delay in reaction whenever something happens. I'm not saying this happened in COVID. I think COVID was a very good example where the country offices and the regional offices reacted very quickly. But in Ebola in 2014, 2015, there was definitely a delay between the country offices in those three African countries uh, alerting the regional office in Brazzaville. And they delayed a bit more because of political pressure. You know, they kept saying, oh, is this really happening? By the time they reported to Geneva, it sort of gotten out of hand. Okay, so those are just uh, uh, three uh, factors, resources, work demands, 
as well as uh, organizational weaknesses. Um, how can it be, be made better? Let me just uh, reflect on the fact that, um, first, first of all, there's a lot of mis... A lot of people don't understand what WHO can and cannot do, mm. okay? It can set norms and standards to guide countries. You already referred to international health regulations. Very good example, standing, uh, setting global norms and standards. It can do that. It can give technical support to countries in health generally. That's why we have 160 uh, country offices. It can convene the best international experts. We had an expert international expert committee for COVID where all the top scientists from the US, from the UK, all work together with WHO. So that's what it can do. It cannot send and mobilize 100 doctors, 100 nurses, 100 tons of equipment and send it to China in 24 hours. It is not that kind of organization, mm -hmm. okay? Let me finish this long story because you get me carried away on this. Um, how can it be made more effective in the future? Bottom line is, like with all UN organization, it has no sovereign authority. It's not a supra, super government, right? It cannot uh, do things that governments can do, enact laws, enforce laws. It can't do that. What it has is moral authority. But let me finish with a very interesting suggestion that I saw in one of the blogs that I follow. Would it be possible in future, specifically with respect, you already referred to compliance to international health regulations, could there be a legal sort of initiative to say that WHO working together with, I don't know, maybe the World Bank, the World Bank, if countries, or oh, sorry, maybe WTO, okay, these were the three organizations mentioned, if countries don't comply with international health regulations, could a body impose sanctions on that country? Now, you know, that's a little bit far-fetched politically because that's not what UN organizations do, but you can see where it's heading. Can there be more, let's say, power given uh, so that, uh, you know, WHO can do what the US did to Iran or to North Korea in terms of uh, sanctions, trade sanctions or economic sanctions or whatever. So that's a long answer to, to, to that question. All right, thank you, uh, Professor. There's a question from Hario of CSIS, I think. Uh, you refer to the R, what is R, R O or R zero? R zero, yeah. R zero, right. <clears throat> that is, uh, you know, between two to three, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, and, at the uh, moment, yeah. At the moment. So uh, do you think R0 in Indonesia is really close to five? This is a scientific part. Of yeah, it. yeah. But once again, you know, uh, I always preface this by saying based on what we know mm. now, okay, it seems to me that anecdotally, the transmissibility of the virus seems to be a bit higher in Indonesia. Uh, I would think that Five is not impossible, okay, but you need a lot more deep data, a lot more research. And um, uh, once again, what you don't know is because of the still fairly limited number of people being tested, mm. okay, uh, you have no idea really of the denominator. So, you know, knee jerk reaction given what's happened so far you would say, oh, maybe it's higher than, than one or two. Uh, but that's just superficial. And I think you really need to collect uh, a lot more data to, to get a more accurate picture. But uh, for the moment, based on what you know, five doesn't seem to be uh, too unrealistic in, in, in my view. It's still, I mean, just to put it in perspective, uh, it's still very, very, still very, very much lower compared to the R0 or R0 for a virus like measles, which is something like 12 or 18. It's much more contagious. 
I see. All right. Thank you. Uh, you refer to uh, the tripod. Uh, you know, that was a statement of uh, the ministry, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Singapore. Mm -hmm. Healthcare, good, uh, good governance and social capital. Yep. Now, there's a question from uh, Aji here uh, about the, the role of industry and businessmen and, and, and all these private sectors in this, uh, if you have some insights on that. Yeah. Um, no, actually, obviously, I, I think that's a very good uh, uh, point to make. Uh, basically, although uh, it's not part of the, of, of the tripod, I would um, actually see uh, industry involvement as actually being a component of all the three legs of the tripod. Okay, let's go through it one by one. In the healthcare, obviously industry, uh, people or companies who are making face masks, uh, companies who are making ventilators, uh, companies who are developing rapid diagnostic kits, those are developing vaccines. They are obviously very important for the healthcare pillar. The governance, uh, good governance pillar, uh, with good governance, which I already mentioned, involve the Ministry for Industry, okay? Mm -hmm. um, Singapore government, probably just like in the US, probably have, let's say the authority or the power to ask certain industries maybe to divert production into sort of needed resources, okay? Like, uh, I can't remember where it was, where one company was, uh, was it a car company or a Boeing that, wa that was asked to start making ventilators, okay? In yeah. Singapore, garment factories, which are, made, which are asked to switch to making face masks. So within governance, within Ministry of Industry, industry, is definitely a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, obviously, in terms of social capital, the communications industry, okay? And you're talking about, you know, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, all the social platform uh, companies, these are private companies, they obviously have a very important role, uh, just as one example, in terms of um, mechanisms they put in place to counteract uh, uh, fake news. And um, the other thing that I've seen with Facebook, Google, and Twitter is that um, uh, whenever people start searching for COVID-19, they redirect the searches to reliable portal of information like WHO, CDC, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think that's a very important point. It may not be you know, a fourth leg of a tripod, but I think it's implicit in all the three pillars. All right, thank you. Uh, I think that also answer a question from uh, uh, Habib from CSIS. I think uh, that's partially referred to the public-private mechanism uh, mm -hmm. in, in Singapore in a way. Now, <clears throat> there's a question about the, uh, what is that? Uh, your, because there are, there are people here asking about the social distancing policies and then a lockdown, partial lockdown and so on. What is, uh, I just uh, summarize all these questions all together. Sure. What is your frank assessment about this social distancing policies or lockdown? How, what are the requirements for this to, you know, to be successful? Okay. Um, you know, a sort of a flippant answer to that is that Social distancing is an aspiration. Uh, it has very clear and laudable objectives, but it is very difficult to implement because implementation depends on so many issues which uh, range from sort of social, cultural uh, aspects, which range into sort of uh, levels of uh, education, um, levels of, uh, let's say, social uh, responsibility, and in fact, almost at the individual level, somebody's capacity to, to
to have empathy, you know, for the welfare of 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 others. So you could, I guess, approach it from a sort of softly, softly point of view. Okay, rely on uh, goodwill and the naive belief. My wife always tells me this uh, that. There is good in everybody. She says, you know, you are being completely ignorant of reality. Okay. Uh, so you can do that softly, softly approach. But as I also mentioned in my slide, um, if the goal is to stop something serious like a pandemic, you must have it complemented with the stick, not just the carrot, but also the stick. And the stick obviously is, uh, for example, regulations, laws, legislation, which is back, for example, in Singapore. Now, I wanted to ask you this. Um, Singapore has an Infectious Diseases Act, which is an act of parliament, which is very powerful. And all laws can be you know, formulated and implemented under that act. Okay, so very powerful legal constitutional sort of foundation for, for doing all these things. So that then allows them like 24 hours to enhance the social distancing measures mm. in law in 24 hours. I was actually quite taken by the speed in which they did this. No warning, 24 hours, bang, that's it. Okay. And within 24 hours, there were roadblocks. There were enforcement officers going around where people tend to gather. First of all, giving them a nice letter Ini surat, ya, jangan buat lagi. But at the same time, you do it again, $300 fine. Okay, so it has to be complemented with enforcement. And of course, one thing that also is a bit uh, sensitive is that in Singapore, um, there's no issue of corruption. There's no issue of you trying to bribe these enforcement officers or the policeman who stops you at a roadblock. Okay, and that makes uh, that results in the population being sort of in a way compliant. Okay, in Indonesian you say nurut perintah, yeah, which could be a bit of a problem in our country. Okay, but you know it it has to be a bit of both. But the problem is how do you balance the two? And once again, once again, Singapore is quite homogeneous. It works in for the whole country as well. But in Indonesia, the balance could be different in different parts of the country. Okay, and this is where once again, the role of the community, you know, your RT, your RW, Ketua RT, Ketua RW, Lura, you know, the, the ulamas, uh, they could be much more important than government officers. You know, it, 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 you need this sort of um, out of the box, multi-sectoral kind of approach. Sorry, long answer to short question. All right, okay. <laughs> but that's uh, really the challenge for Indonesia. Uh, there's a question now, we go back to YouTube. Uh, our YouTube viewer, this is Mbak Felia Salim, I guess. Uh, she's asking, uh, it is obviously it is challenging for Indonesia to get people tested fast enough. Plus there are just too many densely populated area communities. Now, from the scientific perspective, is there any suggestion of how you know, we can mm -hmm. actually do this? Uh, I've read somewhere about the different statistical method, you know, pulling sample and so on that uh, is done by, the, by Germany, you know, because uh, uh, the test kits are limited, but there are ways of doing it you know, strategically through statistical method. Okay. Uh, Felia. Um... I think this is the Felia Salim that we all know. Right, I think so. Yeah, okay. Probably, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good to hear from you. Um, that's a good question. Um, most countries, I mean, Indonesia is a good example, but certainly other countries, Philippines, Vietnam, even Malaysia, which is, let's say, relatively richer, simply not enough tests available to test uh, fast enough, okay? Uh, limitation because of cost, because of technical capability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
how, how to overcome this? Um, let me just mention two things. Uh, Philips, you mentioned um, the approach that some countries have tried to use in terms of using uh, pooled samples, in terms of using mathematical forecasting and projections uh, based on sort of uh, antibody profiles to coronavirus. I think that's all, all fine from, a, let's say, academic uh, technical uh, challenge and perspective. I don't see that being of uh, value in uh, sort of real uh, life uh, situations where you are faced with this, you know, huge influx of severely uh, ill people. But uh, you never know in future, as more and more data is collected, it could become more powerful because I believe that big data analytics, AI in the future, in terms of trends, in terms of projections and forecasting, it will be very powerful. But for now, in, in the context of immediate testing, I think it's still limited. The second thing I want to mention, and I think uh, many of you are aware of this, there is actually quite a few um, claims and you know uh, websites and articles in all kinds of media about more rapid and also cheaper tests. Okay, and I've had a look at, at some of these, and there was one test called a rapid test, which can be can give you a result in fifteen minutes. Okay, so I saw that and I said to myself. Did I miss something? So I took a look at it and it immediately uh, was clear to me that this was a case of, well, I wouldn't call it misinformation, but it is basically sort of not revealing everything, okay? So what this is was basically a test which uses quite old technology, which basically tells whether a person has antibodies to COVID-19, okay? Now the problem with that test, yes, it can give you a result in 15 minutes. The problem with that test is that you can get what is called false positives. So the test is not specific and it may not be sensitive enough, okay? Whereas the PCR test is 99% 0.9% accurate because it actually detects the gene of the virus. Whereas the other one, all it's telling you is whether you've been exposed to some coronavirus in the past, okay? So you need to be careful, okay? So unfortunately, in my own personal view, at the moment, there's no real uh, acceptable substitute to the PCR test. The technical challenge is, can you make the PCR test cheaper and faster. That's a more technologi well, technological challenge and there are a lot of people who are working on it. I remember three years ago, the US Army had a field version, which is the size of a shoe box that could be used you know, in Afghanistan, for example, to do PCR. But I'm not sure whether that's been made sort of widely available, but that's just one example. Right, thank you. Uh... I hope that answers uh, Ibu Felia Salim. Uh, she's watching from YouTube. Uh, there's another one from YouTube from uh, Raymond Chandra Vinata. Uh, Singapore is like a mini laboratory which you can control all the parameters and criteria. Sure. How would you manage a country which has more diverse and bigger population with many cultural you know, differences and so on? And uh, I think uh, given your experience with WHO, uh, if I may add to this question is, uh, have you seen other countries, you know, bigger than Singapore with best practices in preparing their health, you know, a system? Oh, thank you, Raymond. Uh, Raymond's from, from Dexa, Dexa Medica. Probably. Someone I know well, yeah, uh, Raymond. Um, yeah, you know, as I made it very clear, um, Singapore is like a controlled laboratory. It's unique in many, many aspects and what it can do, not many other countries uh, can sort of uh, replicate. Um, I guess based on my experience with uh, uh, WHO, um, 
there are probably not that many countries that uh, have been able to sort of, let's say, uh, apply the Singapore model to the same extent. I can probably think of uh, just based on those countries that, that I have uh, visited. Um, Israel would be one example uh, where, you know, I think size-wise everything and in terms of their technical scientific capacity is sort of very, very well advanced. Um, probably that's the only one that, that comes to mind. Uh, perhaps, um, um, once again, another small country, uh, Luxembourg, okay, which if you see at the moment is, uh, despite it being next door to, to Belgium, uh, has so far not had too many cases. Uh, but if you then sort of uh, computate a little bit bigger, uh, and simply because I spent half of my life in Switzerland, you could say that, yes, Switzerland has a population which is slightly bigger than Singapore. Of course, it's a much bigger country, but not, you know, 100 times the size of Singapore. And yet a rich country like Switzerland has not been able, despite all its scientific capacity, you know, to really do something uh, about this. So Raymond, the quick answer to your question is in very diverse uh, decentralized countries with big populations, uh, I would say the answer is going to be building capacity at the local sub-national level. I don't think there's any shortcut to that, okay? Um, kita nggak bisa nunggu-nunggu. Kita nggak bisa nunggu bantuan dari pusat, yeah? And once again, it goes back to my um, point about leadership, okay? It's all about leadership, okay? If we have leaders like Ibu Risma in Surabaya, I can't remember the name of the governor of Bandung, okay? leaders that have the vision, leaders that know we need to build our own local capacity. Because um, one of my colleagues at WHO who used to be in charge of uh, emergency response, he said, the best way to deal with pandemics is to stop it at the local level. Because once it reaches global or regional, it's too late, talat udah, yeah? So that's, the short answer, you need to build capacity, local, provincial, especially in the context of, of Indonesia, you know, so diverse, so spread out, so limited in capacity. That, that's a big challenge. And as I told an interviewer earlier on, it, it, it really needs leadership, you know, not just from the Menkes, not just, not even from the Menko. It has to come from the president himself. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Now, uh, before I forgot, I have a question uh, um, on the scientific part again. Uh, today, I think in many WhatsApp group in Indonesia, there's this picture being circulated, <clears throat> a screenshot from, uh, I think from a dashboard somewhere that says COVID-19 affects uh, higher income people more than lower income uh, people. Uh, and then the, also, I think uh, the director of Aikman Laboratory in Indonesia uh, this morning or yesterday said a similar thing that uh, it affects you know the rich more, a quote unquote. Now my 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 question: the how, what do we know about this? You know how it affects people from different you know uh, you know income bracket. Is there any you know evidence for on, on this? To be honest, Philips, this is the first time I've heard about this, that there is uh, sort of, I don't know what the evidence is that it affects, you know, higher income compared to, to lower uh, income groups. And once again, once, you know, we need to sort of really see the nature and the quality of, of the data. Mm -hmm. But uh, once again, it's really uh, context specific, you know, was it referring to Jakarta, for example, was it referring to a much broader base, a much bigger sample? Um, uh, I don't know. It has to be linked to sort of where the clusters uh, have been, you know, in terms of the 
where the people got in, infected. Like, for example, you know, the classical case in Malaysia, where the biggest uh, number of cases came from um, religious uh, public gathering, you would you could say that that is quite a good cross section of both high and lower income groups. In fact, maybe more of the lower income. So, you know, I hesitate to comment uh, on that. And in the sense that uh, clearly, you know, this, this is a very fertile area for research. The other sort of, uh, sort of things that have been circulating on a lot of social media is that are people who smoke more likely to get COVID-19. Now that's quite, in a way, an interesting, quite logical question, because if you're a heavy smoker, your lungs are likely to be not working so well. So maybe you're more likely to get COVID. But once again, I haven't seen any evidence in that regard. Uh, what I have seen, and once again, once again, I can't tell you the veracity or the extent of the evidence men seem to be affected more than women, okay? Now, I'm not sure whether you've seen any similar claims in Indonesia, but I've seen that uh, from, from several uh, websites. And once again, intuitively, somebody posted a comment on this to say that, yeah, men compared to women, they are more likely to be smokers. They're more likely to sort of not look after their health, you know, this sort of macho image of, of a man uh, and they are likely as we all know more likely to get heart disease okay so the other piece of evidence i've seen is that of all the underlying conditions as i mentioned in my presentation heart disease seems to be to be the the one as well as obesity and you know anecdotally maybe more men are overweight than than women although you know that's just an anecdotal view. So, in, you know, very fertile area of research in terms of both social and medical risk factors in the future. Maybe, you know, CSIS can uh, develop some good research in this field. For sure. Yeah, we plan to do that with your help as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there's a question. Uh, this is a bigger question, a bigger picture question. Uh, from uh, Liliana, Liliana, do you think the fact that COVID-19 causes big number of deaths around the world prove that we are all countries far away from achieving SDG3, good health and well-being? So how then, the, this is a bigger question uh, we need to tackle as well. Well, obviously, I think because it has affected, I would say by now, with a few ex small exceptions, uh, North Korea being one, although I'm not sure that they actually have no cases. Um, obviously, because it has affected um, so many countries to varying extents, okay, it is definitely going to affect the achievement of the SDGs, mm -hmm. okay? And remember that the, the ultimate or the main let's say vehicle for achieving the F SDG is universal healthcare, okay? JKN or BPJS in Indonesia. So obviously, okay, if a country's health systems and resources are suddenly diverted towards taking care of COVID patients and public health measures to stop the epidemic, obviously other areas of healthcare, I already mentioned stunting, for example, okay, is going to be affected, okay? Uh, so that's what I mean by in future, you know, the government should really focus on strengthening the health system as a whole, as a whole okay? So once again, it'll be very interesting, as you know, the achievement of the SDGs are being monitored quite uh, closely in all countries. Our own Ibu Nasia is very much involved with, uh, the, with Dr. Chris Murray, who came to CSIS. So it'll be very interesting in the next year or two to see the impact of COVID on the achievement of the SDGs. But you know, I, I would almost predict that in the lower middle income, even in the middle income countries, I would say even China, okay, that it will 
have an effect on whether or not they can reach the goals within the time frame. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> There's a uh, all uh, another scientific part of this uh, from Awanda. Many have mentioned the similarity of COVID with the flu. Uh, however, <clears throat> he says, eh, I think that's that's not the case. However, some behavior or, or pattern of the virus show significant relations. If this is similar to the flu, then we could assume that it will be seasonal as well as part of its behavior. Or what's your point of view on this? Yeah, I think I mentioned that during uh, my presentation that, that I agree with that, that it is not going to disappear completely like uh, SARS and MERS, because there are actually quite important differences between COVID and SARS and MERS. As I mentioned, it's more likely to be to become endemic, like seasonal flu. But remember, at this uh, point in time, that it's looking likely that the mortality rate may be a bit higher compared to seasonal flu. But I would think with time, it will probably uh, come down to be about the same as seasonal uh, flu. Uh, why do I say that? As the pandemic goes on, remember that 80% of the people who get infected only have very mild symptoms. And an unknown number are infected, but actually don't get sick at all. But in the bigger picture, what's happening is that immunity, something called herd immunity, is spreading amongst the population. So as time goes on, my guess is, the severity of the disease is going to be less and less, except for the older people with underlying conditions. And you will get pockets of that happening. So that's what I mean by fighting the, the fires. So eventually it will become like a seasonal flu. But once again, that's my own personal view. Something that I have not mentioned, and this is really just a hypothesis is really a, a possibility rather than a probability. Mm -hmm. There is a chance of a mutation happening in the virus. Okay, now I mentioned this because the question was about flu. So you remember the characteristic about flu is it can mutate. You remember what happened with bird flu? Okay, flu buru. There was a mutation that makes it more virulent than the usual seasonal flu. There is H7N9 in China. So the virus can mutate. I'm not saying it's going to happen with COVID, but the possibility is there. I would guess from a scientific point of view, and there have been some papers published on this. Somebody sent me a paper that showed seven mutations in the COVID virus already, okay? But a mutation does not necessarily mean it's going to cause severe disease and a bigger epidemic. A mutation can be totally harmless. It's just a small change in the genetics of the virus. But that's something we, we need to keep in mind. Could it be like seasonal flu? Could it be, and this is what I also mentioned, what is the animal reservoir? Remember that in the case of seasonal flu, the mutation happens when the virus mixes with burro, with chickens, with pigs, okay? We don't know what is the animal host for COVID, okay? So another area of research, and in future, if this interaction happens, it's perfectly possible that you will get a mutant form of COVID in the future where people are not immune, okay? So once again, long answer to actually an important question. Right, thank you. Um, and uh, kind of a follow-up question on that from, uh, again, from YouTube viewer, uh, Hans Nyo from Samarang. What is the most critical comorbid for COVID-19 in elderly? I think I've already said that. It's basically heart disease. Penyakit jantung, kemudian obesitas, 
kemudian tekanan darah tinggi, high blood pressure, and maybe to slightly less, lesser extent, uh, diabetes and uh, cancer. Those are the main comorbidities. Obviously, people that have those have reduced immune uh, systems. And uh, once the data comes out, I would be very interested to see, also in the context of Indonesia, whether TB, TB say, mm -hmm. could be another comorbid because obviously it affects the lungs. Okay. So maybe this is the last question because uh, surprisingly, almost two hours we, we talked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. And it's Sorry. very efficient. You know? <laughs> and you need to go in 15 minutes as well. Yeah, right. Okay. So, you know, this is the, the last question. Sure. How far away do you think we are from the finding of the vaccine? Well, that's very easy to answer. At least a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, now what, what I want to alert people is the following. A lot of things are going around uh, the, the, the web, even in, in scientific discussions. I have seen at least 10 or 12 companies, big and small, government-sponsored, public-private partnerships, um, uh, doing development for vaccines for COVID. Um, some of them have claimed that they are already testing it in patients, okay? in clinical trials with limited numbers. But being a microbiologist, okay, that's a long way from having a vaccine which is approved by the regulatory authorities in Indonesia by BEPOM, okay? BEPOM has to be convinced, number one, that the vaccine works, number two, that the vaccine is safe, Number three, which is a lesser consideration, that the vaccine is affordable. And also that the vaccine can be easily given to people. That whole process of testing, publishing the research, make sure it's safe, getting the regulatory approval will take at least one year. Now, having said that, there is a mechanism that was um, um, uh, piloted during Ebola, and the argument is we can't wait a whole year, okay? When countries are willing, let's say, to give emergency approval, in other words, bypass their normal regulatory processes, this is a national emergency. If the vaccine is shown to be at least safe and maybe works a little bit, give emergency approval for the vaccine to be tested. Mm. That happened during Ebola. A few candidate vaccines were tested. So, but in terms of, of the normal timeline, at least one year. All right. Thank you, uh, Professor Tiki Pangastu. It's been very useful and very informative. If I may summarize, uh, actually, it's already on your slide. There are three lessons from Singapore. Number one is the medical and public health. Uh, robust response. Number two, the existence of uh, good governance. And number three, of course, the, the society that trusts the government. And that, I think, in principle, because other details, as you said, cannot be transported from Singapore to other countries, given the context. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to all uh, uh, people who are watching this, attending this, uh, thank you very much. We are going to have another <clears throat> round of uh, uh, webinar. Uh, uh, Tuesday next week with Professor Gil Park from South Korea, from Daegu University. Daegu is the epicentrum of uh, COVID-19 cases in, in, in South Korea. So we also uh, would like to learn from the South Korean experience. Thank you very much, Patiki Pangestu. Uh, you've been very generous with your time. And uh, yeah, um, dari pihak saya, uh, terima kasih, uh, Philips dan CSIS dan semua yang telah berpartisipasi I really enjoyed uh, uh, getting those very nice uh, questions and I hope I've answered uh, them satisfactorily. Dan um, kepada teman-teman semua di, di tanah air, jaga-jaga ya semua. Semoga kita bisa bersama mengatasi masalah ini. 
thank, thank you, you Phillips. thank you Patiki. stay healthy and stay safe and uh, stay healthy safe uh, everybody thank you you all also thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.